It's like somebody else already has control over the stream. Is oh there it went. No. It's still doing the thing. And there we are. And there we are. All right. Welcome back. So we have another session. This time is going to be with our friend here, Jack Baker. Welcome, Jack. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right. And also we got Fallible here as well. Hey, Fallible. Hello. So Jack was going to uh, tell us a little bit, at least he did tell us a little bit in his presentation about how he kind of attacked game servers. Uh, Jack, do you want to kind of give you a little bit of an introduction of yourself and just kind of a super brief overview of your talk so we, uh, other people might get a, a, more interested in it as well, um, on top of some of the other questions that we're already seeing in the Track 1 Live QA channel? Uh, yeah, for sure. So um, my name is Jack Baker. I uh, don't have much of a background to talk about. Uh, th this is my uh, second time speaking at DEF CON. Both times have been about hacking video games. Uh, and for my talk this year, it was basically about finding bugs in game engines. So basically looking at the core software that you build video games on with the hope that finding bugs in the engine means finding bugs in a thousand different games, basically uh, amplifying that effort. Um, so I had a reasonable amount of luck looking at uh, Unreal Engine 4 from Epic Games and UNET, the uh, core networking protocol of Unity. Uh, and I talk about four of those bugs. Uh, and I, uh, I give some POCs, uh, typical DEF CON stuff, I guess. Yeah, it was all pretty awesome stuff in there. Valve, do we have any questions coming in yet for Jack? We have a very first question over here. I like this, and this is from Hawkeye Dank. Um, do you believe that most game servers slash developers are heading towards a zero trust architecture for newer games in order to better protect the game servers? That is a good question. So I would actually argue that to some extent that has already been done. Like uh, if I were to go back a bunch to when I was a teenager trying to learn to hack video games, I remember that there was sort of this philosophy that like the only game, the only online game you really couldn't hack was RuneScape. And the reason for that is RuneScape is about as close as you'll get to just a pure thin client uh, in like a, a big video game. And so you couldn't really manipulate the client to do things like teleport or whatever, because it was just basically just uh, button presses. Um, now, it, in that case, though, people still managed to quote unquote hack RuneScape, but it was in the form of logical bugs. It wasn't, it wasn't trust being placed on the client. So like to to answer that question, I think that you absolutely can make a zero trust uh, game engine as is, but you're balancing like performance and and security. And if you go too far in the security side, you end up with a game like RuneScape, which is very low, very slow, um, uh, uh, with not a whole lot going on. You, It's very difficult to apply that to something like, I don't know, Fortnite, where you've got a thousand, not well, I guess a hundred people shooting guns. You've got all this math going on. It's just a different scale of a problem. But we are we're getting much better at it. Uh, game engines have gotten significantly better at taking that trust away. So yeah, I think that's that's where things are going to keep moving is. Uh, taking that trust away and finding clever ways to make uh, servers that can still handle a first person shooter, still handle Fortnite, uh, but don't have to put trust on the client to do that. And from the perspective of game hackers, hacking will just become more of, uh, more of a process of finding logical bugs rather than ex doing what we typically do now, which is exploiting those trust relationships. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. Um, so a slightly different angle of a question coming from uh, Blackfoot over here. Uh, why do you think there is so little security knowledge share between game companies? Example, little documentation on hardening of UE4 dedicated servers. That's a pretty good question. If I had to guess, it would just be because game engines are such, uh, they're, they're such big pieces of software that when you develop your own game engine, you're sort of going to try to hold it close to your chest. You don't really want to give your competitors a, set, a competing game engine uh, the 
the keys to the kingdom, uh, so to speak. So architecturally, most game engines are built from the ground up. There is not a lot of shared code, and that's just because it's uh, it, it's a big investment, and no one wants to share that. Uh, it's sort of a boring business answer, I think, but it's really just you know Unreal and Unity and whoever else don't want to share their work with each other. So in your yeah, in your presentation, uh, one of the things that you were showing was kind of like the, the teleporting and the fast running. You know, I, I remember at one point in there, you're just kind of showing somebody running at the normal speed. And then the, the exploit that you were able to find where somebody's zipping across the screen. Um, in addition to running, do you think there are other things that people could use that kind of thing for? Maybe be able to shoot faster, shoot more? Maybe what other kind of things have you thought of that somebody could use that type of exploit for in their games? Yeah, absolutely. So with that particular bug, I did something. I found what I think is really interesting. It's basically a bug where you can use the unique properties of some uh, special floating point values to basi basically confuse the server into doing something it shouldn't. And so I have actually tried basically that exact technique on other games, other uh, commands and stuff like that. And you can usually get something uh, something unpredictable to happen. I think I mentioned in my talk, a lot of times it's not a good thing. Uh, a lot of times you're just harming yourself, but you can usually cause the game to do something it shouldn't. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I think... Uh, these logical bugs, especially like mathematical bugs, if you can find those, are re a really good way to uh, exploit games because while the bugs aren't the most common, they are very predictable. They're not a, a, a memory corruption bug where you have to worry about layout of memory and all those complicated things. Uh, and they uh, they tend to... I guess slip by the uh, the the architectural protection. So in that case, like uh, like the bug you talked about, Unreal Engine has a pretty robust way to prevent speed hacking, and uh, using just a couple quirks of uh, basically uh, quirks of decimal numbers, you can cause it to do something it shouldn't, and that is super useful. So that particular kind of bug, I'd say yes, definitely applies in other places. It's just a matter uh, of looking for it, and uh, uh, I guess that's it. I don't know how I was going to end that sentence. <laughs> no, I really liked what you showed there, especially you were it, the things that we find in other places across security and, and other types of hacking. You go, well, okay, let's divide by zero. Let's use not a number. Let's use these things that are the the outsides of this language that's being used and see what happens when you throw it at the system. And it's just nice to see in the, the niche that you found yourself in, a lot of the same techniques work. Yeah, um, I, I guess one other thing I like about that bug is that it's not something that's fixed by say, oh, we're gonna stop writing things in C and start writing them in Go or Rust or something. These are bugs that still exist even in uh, quote unquote safe languages. And I think uh, in more than just video games, that's where this sort of exploitation is going. And that's why I like that bug so much. All right. So Hawkeye has another question for you. He uh, asks, have you noticed any new trends of input validation in high user games like Fortnite? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I keep going back to the same example, but uh, Unreal Engine 4 uses a really, uh, really robust uh, system for validating user input and specifically user movement uh, in a way that scales really well, but also basically eliminates your ability to uh, manipulate your movement in any significant way. And so essentially that the... The broad strokes are basically taking the uh, taking authority over your character's location, putting it on the server, and giving the client the possibility to call functions in order to request that you move. And that that way, the server has the context to say, "Well, you're trying to move too fast. Uh, I'm not going to allow that. I'm going to limit movement to a specific range." And so. Really, the I think the entirety of 
like evolutions in the security of game engines uh, recently has just been on giving more context to the server so we can say, well, that's not right. I'm going to I'm going to stop that from happening and ensuring that the client doesn't have the trust to just overrule the server. I can't remember whether you said in your presentation, if you've uh, talked to the uh, engine companies about these vulnerabilities and if they have fixed the exploits that you found. Uh, but if they do see somebody trying to send like your uh, NAN, not a number at the server, what types of things would you think that they should do to that? Should they kind of just adjust or ban or what are your thoughts for how people could what should happen to them? Yeah, so uh, three of the four bugs I talk about are fixed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the the uh, speed hack one, the NAN one, uh, was one of those. It was actually a pretty easy fix. They just put a tiny little check in there that says, if this is NAN, just abort it, get out of there. Uh, but in general, I would say the uh, what they should... What I would recommend possibly that if you're a game engine developer or you're working on Unreal and you think, oh, this could be a problem, it's not uh, unreasonable to just say you shouldn't be able to use NAN in any argument. That's not going to happen under normal circumstances uh, and just essentially eliminate that from the serialization and deserialization process. Uh, Unreal doesn't do that because it wants to consider itself sort of impartial to that. Whatever goes in one end comes out the other, is deserialized on the other end. Uh, but if I, I think it would be a pretty, uh, pretty reasonable assumption to say, if you're getting certain types of say floating point numbers, this is blatantly invalid and we can probably just toss it out before we even consider anything else. Just a general input validation on, on what's coming in. Typical boring stuff. <laughs> Isn't it that way? <laughs> well, um, so I don't really want to give away the, the uh, punchline to your presentation because it fits so well, but we'll just uh, kind of hand wave that and say, so when you've been doing this, how often do you get booted from whatever uh, game you're playing or how many times have you had your accounts banned? When you're building your own stuff, you get banned less than you might expect. Uh, when I did a talk last year on hacking basically browser games. And for one of the demonstrations, I took uh, a game. I don't want to say its name. I've, I've done enough to them. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I took this game and it has a global scoreboard and I just set my score to one three 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 something seven and username to high defcon and they banned me pretty quickly. I think that was that was pretty obvious. But in general, if you're if you're building your own game hacks, there is a pretty good chance you're gonna get away with it. So I, I get banned pretty rarely. So congratulations or I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> however you feel about that. It's a mixed bag. Well, where do you also often kind of see the line here along the same, I guess, similar to what Fallible was just talking about, where um, the old question about research versus going over the line, because essentially you are affecting other users potentially, um, as well as that game engine. So where's kind of your line on how far you'll go with your research? Um, or is it because it's in the name of research, you'll just go all the way with it? No, uh, I, I mean, I won't do anything that's, I, I think, directly affecting uh, someone spending money or someone uh, or anything like that. I'm not uh, stealing items from people in online games. That that certainly crosses the line. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if someone's in a lobby of a first person shooter and someone wall hacks through and, uh, you know, no scopes them in the head, I don't think they've been <laughs> uh, significantly harmed in any way. So I, 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 I think that... That is that is within moral bounds for me. <laughs> Excellent. Can you explain some of the technical setup that you have in order to uh, capture the data that you're sending across, and what tools are you using? What's your what's your lab look like? Yeah. So um, working with Unreal Engine is uh, especially, uh, I needed to actually buy a new desktop to do because. 
on the laptop I was working on, it took most of the day to compile Unreal from source. And I was doing that uh, several times a day. So that was uh, not not good math working out there. So essentially, I, I do all of my Unreal development on Linux, which is a little less supported, but it's just more comfortable for me. Uh, and the other, I guess the other thing that's really uh, a challenge is the specifically Unreal Source is so big that trying to open it in most like project editors is it does not work. Uh, VS Code gets by just a little bit, but even then it gets tripped up when you try to go to this function or something like that. It'll end up uh, it'll spin its wheels for five minutes and say, yeah, couldn't find it, uh, even though you know it exists. So I wish I had a, a, a better setup. I'm sure people who do actual video game development have uh, better experiences with building Unreal from source. But it, I guess my lab is just, uh, I, uh, it's a System76 desktop th with the highest you know, boxes checked on everything just so that I can compile Unreal as many times as I want and it doesn't take me all day. So in that way, you are, you're looking at the guts of the code. You're, you're really building it each time. It's not a situation of you're just capturing everything in Wireshark and modifying it uh, somehow and no uh, i wish it was a little easier uh with unit you can get away with uh just looking at the traffic in wireshark unreal is pretty difficult because everything is like bit aligned so you'll have a string that starts four bits in and just looks like gibberish so uh you really do have to be looking at it at the low level to really make any sense of it and how does uh, that make sense and how does somebody kind of get started with that kind of thing? Because this sounds extremely technical and you have to know quite a bit. Uh, how does somebody, like where would be the, the entry point if somebody was interested in this kind of research in order to uh, start figuring these kinds of things out if they wanted to just even look at how games work? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, all the code is out there for Unreal Engine, but I don't think that's something you should just jump straight into, especially not if you're pretty, if you're not pretty familiar with uh, C++, because it is a, a complicated code base. I think the best thing you can do to understand uh, uh, hacking video games is to build them. Uh, it's sort of a, a, I don't know, cliche answer, but that is what teaches you, oh, this is how that works. This is how I'd write it. This is probably how it, uh, how it looks on the back end. Uh, also, I would say if you're going to look at games written in a particular engine, Unity games are pretty good because they're usually built, uh, well, they're they're built with C Sharp and they're typically easy to decompile back to C Sharp with something like DN Spy, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. However, that's verbalized. Uh, so you can actually look at the code of the game, modify it, see what happens, and basically hack games without too much... Uh, too much actual like binary reverse engineering or an, anything like that. So we got a question from Jade that I'm going to I'm going to obscure this a little bit. Uh, the the question is way too specific. So let's go more along the lines of where else would be interesting to look if you were done with the research that you've done so far, and you were looking for a new product, um, what would be the things that would draw you to a new product to go experiment? Yeah, so uh, uh, like one thing I would say is that when you look at Unity, there are a lot of different uh, multiplayer solutions. So I looked at Unet, which is sort of the, it, it's provided by Unity. But there are third-party solutions that are pretty common, uh, Photon, Mirror. I haven't looked at those at all. And I think that there's a pretty solid chance that the same kind of bugs apply there. Uh, and then I think most of the research I did, obviously I'm just looking at the core engines for games. But looking at specific games, you can find these exact same bugs. They're just They just may not apply to other games so i think most of this research still applies it just needs to be targeted either at different games or different multiplayer protocols even different game engines uh game maker 
Uh, there are, uh, well, I think I've looked at the two more common game engines. There are other engines out there. In other words, just find another big target and play, or just go and learn something. If you happen to be using a game, then this might be a good opportunity. Um, Hawkeye Dank asked another question about um, the outcome of your work, and he wants to know if you've uh, managed to pull any bounties for this. Uh, yeah, I turned down bounties for a few things because I wanted to talk about them. Uh, if I was really like min-maxing it, I probably would have accepted bounties for a few more, but uh, you never know. Um, so yes, uh, Unity and Epic Games were both really good about this. Uh, and uh, Epic has a Hacker One program. Unity, you want to just go straight to their security at Unity 3D or whatever. I don't want to give you the wrong email. Security at email address. Uh, but both were awesome to work with. I would say uh, I would highly recommend it. And yes, there is definitely money to be made. And you've looked at the Unreal and Unity engines. Are there any others that you've looked at or found bugs with? Uh, I have done a fair amount of reverse engineering on Game Maker, uh, which is one of the more common engines, certainly less than Unity or Unreal. Uh, not from a security perspective, just from a, a how do I hack this game or how do I understand, how do I mod this game mm -hmm. uh, aspect. And uh, I guess one of the problems is that some of these uh, smaller engines don't provide you the same uh, same tools. They may not have an entire networking solution, so there's less places for bugs to be hiding. Uh, that's why I think Unity and Unreal were such good targets. But I do think there there is opportunity for bugs in those other engines. I just really haven't done the work in that context. And have you also looked at uh, the individual games itself? And what's really the difference between trying to find vulnerabilities in the game engine and a specific game? I guess usually the difference is whether or not you're going to have uh, easily accessible source. Uh, so Unreal Engine games, reverse engine, act, like reverse engineering an actual released Unreal Engine game can be pretty tedious because you're not looking at the source. You're not typically even looking at something with symbols, you're just looking at a gigantic blob in Ida or Ghidra. Um, but I have I have had some success there. I don't want to burn bridges, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, but uh, I guess the the main difference is just how much how much effort goes into reverse engineering. Um. This sounds like a pretty specific question, but we'll toss it out there. So thoughts on cheat engine or memory scanners as a toolkit from beginners. That's from uh, ethics. Yeah, uh, uh, cheat engine is awesome. It's how I started learning. My talk last year was on essentially applying a lot of the methods and techniques of cheat engine to WebAssembly, so games in your browser, basically. So I think cheat engine is great. Uh, it is a problem that as games get or as game engines get more secure those techniques don't work as well so uh to give a, a general example what cheat engine generally does what you're usually doing with it is you look for something like your health and you say okay i'm looking for a uh, something in memory that's 100 then i take some damage and say okay of all those values that used to be 100 which one is now 87 or something like that and that helps you find the value in memory that corresponds to your health. And then you can manipulate that, uh, you, you know, give yourself more health, whatever. Uh, but as games take trust away from the client, that process doesn't work anymore. You can manipulate your health client side, but the server still knows you have 87 health, not 10,000 or whatever. So um, I, I do think if you're looking at the right games, that is a great way to get into game hacking and understand those basic concepts. But it's not going to work on, uh, I don't know, PUBG or something where someone has sort of put a conscious effort into making it secure and at something that's come out in the last, I don't know, five years, a decade, something like that. And how much now are the developers trying to go with more, I don't know if it's the right term for it, to call it like the, the thin client? so that people can't really make changes in, in the client side or like in their mobile device, if I want to give myself 
a million lives or a million gems or coins or anything like that and trying to keep all of that on the server. How much of that do you kind of see with the, 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 the games and the servers? Yeah, in my experience, uh, it's really just whatever the engine does, the developer will follow. Uh, Unreal sets you up really well to build an architecture where those game hacks don't work or are exceptionally difficult. And so you see developers doing a pretty good job. Uh, Unity does not set you up quite as well from the start. And so you'll see the majority of those, uh, I guess we'll call simple attacks, do often work. Um, that's not to say that you can't build a secure architecture on Unity. It just means that uh, Unity's not doing the work for you. And uh, like I said, developers don't uh, will typically follow what the engine does. So as the the core software, as the water level rises, developers get better at it as well. Cool. Um, is there anything that you didn't get a chance to put into your presentation that is additional research that you might have done? Or are there any kind of other areas that you think other people might be able to add on to the research that you've done? Yeah, I mean, so a couple things come to mind. The first is uh, the floating point bugs I've talked about. I think that can apply a lot. If uh, I very briefly mentioned this, but that attack does actually apply to Unity. The difference is that Unity doesn't, you don't need to speed hack Unity. You can just, or at least by using the core components that are provided for you, you can just tell it, I'm at XYZ. And if you tell it, I'm at, you know, Nan, 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 you get teleported to this weird like dimension where everything is like infinitely small. It's kind of cool. It's not very useful. Uh, so I think that kind of attack applies to a lot of things, and I'd like to see where else it goes. Uh, something else that I feel like I I wanted to do, but I didn't quite uh, find all the pieces, was I found a number of like memory corruption bugs, like buffer overflow stuff like that. But and and a lot of those seemed like they would be good for turning something into remote code execution. But the problem that I was always running into is. I couldn't imagine a situation where you were looking at a game server and you knew what it looked like on the back end. So a memory corruption exploit re requires some knowledge of memory, of the layout of memory, where where code is, gadgets, stuff like that. And while you may have a copy of the client, you don't have a copy of the server. And so even if you can bypass all those difficult protections, ASLR, stuff like that, I just couldn't imagine a scenario where I could turn one of these into an RCE exploit on an actual server. And so that's why I, I, I felt a little disappointed in myself because I had what felt like good bugs, but it didn't feel practical to turn them into, uh, into a, an exploit that would work in the real world. So I would love to see someone actually pull that off. So we are right down to the to the bare end of this thing. So two questions. One is, um, would you be willing to post places that people can find you later, whether that be an email or a website or Twitter? Uh, we can do that in the track one channel at the end of this. And two, if you were to leave us with a call to action, something you would like us to uh, consider as we're moving forward. I've been asking this of everybody. I kind of like it as a question. What should we take away from this and uh, in our own work? And how can we translate your stuff into ours? What would you want us to do? Uh, yeah, so absolutely. Uh, I will post my GitHub. It is on the slides as well, but I'll post it again. My uh, email address is there too. Hit me up. I've already had a few people. Uh, I've had a couple really interesting conversations, so I really appreciate it when uh, people reach out. And I, I don't know, if I could ask for anything, it would be that if you're a security person, you work uh, pen testing or whatever, Try hacking video games. It's fun. I know you probably like video games because you're a nerd and you're a death <laughs> Uh So am I. Uh, try it. It's 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 rewarding. Uh, it gets your adrenaline pumping, and getting banned is fun too. So uh, that's my recommendation: is if you haven't ever gotten banned from a video game, give it a shot. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for doing this, Jack. Appreciate you taking the time to be with us and really enjoyed your presentation. Hopefully everybody else goes and checks that out. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys. This was fun.
All right. We will be back in about 30 minutes with another speaker.